Hello, and welcome to another episode of Crimes and Witch Demeanors. I'm your host, Joshua Spellman. Today, we are starting the year off right with something we should have done a lot earlier. I don't know why we haven't, but a haunted library. Well, almost. A haunting that's because of a library. Just listen, you'll see. Today, we are investigating the ghosts and spirits of the New York State Capitol Building in Albany. It is home to three known spirits. The artist, William Morris Hunt, a night watchman by the name of Samuel Abbott, and a fruit vendor. There was at least one more confirmed death of a construction worker at the site that may or may not contribute to the hauntings. Both the fruit vendor and the construction worker have remained nameless in all of the internet articles I've read, and today on this episode, we are going to be changing that and finally giving them their names. So join me in discovering their identities and learning more about the tragic fire that erased centuries of history and caused billions of dollars in damage, which of course, in typical crimes in which demeanors fashion, lets me talk about the importance of preservation in libraries and the dangers that both physical and digital records pose to the preservation of our material culture and history. But before we get to our main ghost story, we do have to talk about the building itself. Because not only is the building impressive as a structure, which it undoubtedly is, it's also integral to discussing the spirits that haunt it and how this came to happen. The New York State Capitol Building is an incredibly large and imposing structure that fills two whole city blocks. Five architects worked on its design and it was heralded as one of the most beautiful buildings in America, though it was also criticized for being an oversized and costly spectacle which they were not wrong about. Construction took place between 1867 and 1899 at a cost of over $25 million, or the modern-day equivalent of $768 million. It was built entirely by hand using white granite from Maine and sandstone, and in some places the walls are four to five feet thick. Now, its architectural style is quite unique, and that is due in part because of its five architects, which did not work on the project simultaneously, leading to what historians refer to as the Battle of the Styles. It also has led to some interesting mishaps, not all stemming from the architects, but I'm sure these oversights were due in part to some of the chaos and disorganization. My favorite highlight of the mishaps of the Capitol Building construction was that it was initially built on top of quicksand. Quicksand. I thought that only happened in Scooby-Doo cartoons. I don't even know how that happened. You would think that the land surveyors might have noticed that they were sinking quickly into the ground. So they had to dig out all of the quicksand in the area and then they had to replace it with clay and concrete. Now, another major mistake that happened is quite, to my archivist's soul, unforgivable. And that is that the original cornerstone of the building, which contained a time capsule with currency of the time, newspapers, and other artifacts had been lost because the builders forgot to mark it. So somewhere in the state capitol now lies a time capsule, and no one knows which stone it is. It's completely lost to time. Now a little bit more about the style of this building. The first architect, Thomas Fuller, designed the first floor in a classical Romanesque style. However, he ended up leaving the project, and from 1875 to 1883, Henry Hobson Richardson and Leopold Eidlitz worked on the building and continued it in a Renaissance style. Also during this time, Frederick Law Olmsted, who was a frequent collaborator with Richardson, was hired for the landscape architecture. And the final architect on the project was Isaac G. Perry, who was assigned to the project by Grover Cleveland. He actually became the first New York State architect and is known for many institutional buildings and asylums across the state. So while the exterior itself is very stately, grand, and breathtaking, it reminds you of something you would see in Europe. The inside is really where the design and architecture shines, particularly the Western Grand Staircase is a testament to the intricacies and details of this building's bold design. The Western Staircase was initially begun by Richardson and was completed by Perry, who more or less kept the original design but added even more carved elements than were originally planned. What's interesting is the Grand Staircase lacks a dome, and in fact, the New York State Capitol is one of only 10 U.S. Capitol buildings without one. 
but in place of a dome is a magnificent 3,000 square foot skylight. 3,000 square feet. That is literally bigger than any house I have ever lived in. 3,000 square feet is massive, and it has over 200 individual panes of glass. The vaulted ceilings and walls are made of sandstone and are carved with these really intricate acanthus leaf designs, scroll designs, and within these designs are about 77 famous faces of the day. However, those are just the identifiable faces, are the 77. There are more figures of the time that are unidentified, and also the sandstone carvers were allowed to carve what they called a memory into the sandstone. So many of them chose to carve the faces of their wives or their children. However, there was one cheeky bugger who may have had a bit of a dark side, and he chose to carve the face of a demon tucked in between some leaves in a dark, dark hallway. It's very, very tiny. I will put an image of it on the podcast Instagram. It's so small that it said that if you are able to find this carving in the wall on your own accord, you yourself are a devil. And of course, the devil is in the details, and the Capitol building is full of them. And in fact, one of the lost details are the murals of artist William Morris Hunt. Hunt was commissioned to paint two 45-foot-long murals directly onto the sandstone walls of the Senate Assembly Chamber. Now, these works were amazing. They were titled The Flight of Night and Discover, and Hunt actually considered them to be his magnum opus, or magnus op, I don't know Latin or the plural of that, but essentially they were his greatest works. Sadly, the ceiling of the assembly chamber was deemed unstable, and it had to be lowered significantly, which permanently obscured the artwork. The ceiling had to be lowered four feet lower than where the artworks were, so they were completely lost. Future murals were planned to be created by Hunt, but unfortunately these plans were deserted due to a lack of funding. Sadly, the obfuscation of these artworks largely attributed to the deepening depression of Hunt and his eventual suicide. It's said that his ghost still haunts the Capitol today, mourning the loss of his magnificent works. While this was a curse for Hunt, it may have been a blessing for the state capital at large. The lowered ceiling was intended to be made of solid oak. However, the contractor at the time cheated the state to line his own pockets with some cash. Instead of using solid oak, he used some oak paneling that was filled with a type of paper mache. While this was a contentious issue at the time, it ended up saving the assembly chamber in 1911 when true tragedy struck. Well, good evening. What are you still doing here? An old man asked, a lantern in one hand and a silver-handled cane in the other. Working late? Oh, good evening, Mr. Abbott. Oh, well, you know, a librarian's work is never done, the man replied. Plus, the Tammany caucus didn't wrap up until, he glanced down at his pocket watch, nearly one o'clock this morning, so I'm just closing up the state library now. I believe they're still in the assembly library, up to God knows what. I hate that the assembly uses their library as a social venue, always drinking and smoking, even with their wives around. Old man Abbott chuckled. (laughs) Well, I'll make sure they don't get into too much trouble. That is my job, after all, he said, patting the small firearm on his side. I will sleep a little better knowing you're on the lookout, the librarian sighed. (sighs) I suppose I'm just a little on edge about it all. With the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire last week, I can't stop thinking about what would happen if something like that were to occur here, with all the cigarettes flying about. Well, Abbott said thoughtfully, they do say this building is fireproof, and I'm sure we'll be able to put out a blaze before it got too serious. Remember that fire a few years ago in the cellar from the electrical? That wasn't much of a problem. We just shut the doors and it burned itself out. You're right, you're right, the librarian replied. I'm just being overly anxious. Typical librarian behavior. Well, good night, Samuel, the librarian said, waving his hand as he exited the library. Good night, Abbott said as he resumed his patrol of the stacks. Samuel Abbott smiled. He looked toward the intricate ceilings, drinking in the newfound silence of the library. (sighs) What a job he had. 
What a life he had. The relative stillness of the state capitol at night was a stark contrast to the hustle and bustle of it during the day, which was not dissimilar to the cacophony of the Civil War that oftentimes still rang through Samuel's ears. But at night, the night was different. A peaceful, cool stillness that only being surrounded by marble and stone could impart. There was nothing like wandering the corridors alone, absorbing all the artistry around him. It seemed every night he would find some new detail tucked away into the sandstone by some coy artisan. And despite being an old man of 78, Samuel was happy to be working. There was always something new, something exciting. The State Library itself, with its hundreds of thousands of books, or even more exciting, the archaeological artifact collection, unique items and treasures from all over the world, and he was able to spend time alone with them. There was never a night that he didn't find something to excite him, and this night was no different. Fire! Fire! A panicked voice shouted from somewhere in the hall. Samuel rushed as fast as he could from the library and found a man looking around, frantic. What's going on? Samuel asked, concerned. There's a fire. A fire in the assembly library. It was just a small fire on the desk. It could have easily been put out with just a bucket of water, but... We just couldn't find any. We thought we'd shut the door and let it burn out while we got something to extinguish it, but but when we got back, it's engulfed the entire library. We have to get everyone out of the building. Samuel didn't say a word. He just nodded in understanding and rushed back into the library, with only the cool calmness that a Civil War veteran could muster. Is anyone in here? He shouted through the library, his voice echoing on the walls. He had just performed his rounds and didn't see anyone, but he had to make sure. There's a fire and we have to evacuate. He listened. The only thing he could hear were the echoes of his voice and the distant commotion in the assembly room. Samuel looked around the library at the thousands of books and records around him and was suddenly overcome by their importance. Family genealogies, state records, even materials from the founding fathers were in this library. Without a second thought, Samuel made his way around the library, flinging open windows in hopes that he could save some of the material. What are you doing? Someone gasped from the doorway. We have to go, they shouted before running off. I'll be out in a moment, Samuel grumbled back, continuing his valiant crusade to save the library. Smoke began to pour in from one of the entrances. Then flames leapt out, licking the nearest shelf of books, setting them ablaze. Soon, the fire spread down the stacks, and the smoke was so thick that Samuel could hardly see. Wheezing, he hobbled on his cane out into the hallway. He could hear voices in the distance, but he seemed to be the only one around. Everyone else had evacuated to safety. Satisfied, Samuel began to make his way as quickly as possible to the grand staircase, but what he saw was a scene straight from the ninth circle of hell. The flames were burning so hot that the staircase was, was it melting? The staircase was turning into a molten slurry, and Samuel could hear cracks forming in the massive skylight above. He couldn't leave this way. He pivoted and made his way down to a narrow corridor. He knew this building like the back of his hand, and this was the closest and safest way out, just through the small, claustrophobic hallway. The smoke seared his lungs. He could hardly see. He reached for the keys on his belt. He knew that the door ahead would be locked. It was only 50 feet or so. Crack! The sound was deafening. The skylight above the grand staircase had shattered. And though it was far behind him, it sounded like it was just above him, and he ducked instinctively. No, wait, something was falling. The walls and ceiling of the corridor were crumbling, falling down all around him. He just had to make it 40 more feet. A large chunk of stone fell next to Samuel, just missing him. He hobbled along 30 more feet. He coughed. His eyes were feeling heavy. His lungs were burning. Just 20 feet. He grabbed the keys from his belt and found the key. 15 feet. The glass of the door ahead shattered in front of him, which was actually fortunate in case he couldn't get the lock. Just 10 more feet. His feet felt heavy. His vision blurred. He was losing consciousness, but he was almost there. Five feet. Blackness. Poor Samuel Abbott perished just five feet from safety. His body buried beneath the debris. It would not be found for days. Samuel Abbott was the sole human casualty of the 1911 Capitol Building fire. Despite his brave actions, much of the library's collections and state records were lost. 
more than 500,000 books, 300,000 colonial manuscripts, state census records, Revolutionary War records, were all destroyed alongside another 10,000 archaeological and ethnographic artifacts. Miraculously, the only items left unscathed by the raging inferno were the Native American artifacts. Were they protected by ancestor spirits? The blaze was eventually extinguished, but it completely destroyed about a quarter of the capital. And unfortunately, neither the material inside nor the building itself were insured, which was especially catastrophic since the fire caused anywhere between $8 million to $12 million in damage, or equivalent of $209 to $314 million today. In a strange twist of fate, the paper mache paneling in the assembly room that covered up the beautiful artwork helped to save the day. If the ceiling in the assembly was made of solid oak, as had been planned, it would have been engulfed in mere minutes. However, the paper mache filling of the paneling absorbed the water from the firefighters' hoses and slowed the progress of the fire, saving the assembly room from total wreckage and preventing the spread of the fire to the rest of the capital. Though Samuel Abbott perished, the jangle of keys can be heard late at night. Locked doorknobs turn and are tugged at. It appears that Samuel's ghost is still wandering the halls. Not tortured, not in pain, but happily carrying out his nightly duties, ensuring the safety of everyone, helping to avoid any future tragedy that may befall New York State's capital. For a story about a library fire, honestly, the accuracy of the articles about it are astoundingly poor. In more than one article, William Morris Hunt is called William Morris Hunter. However, luckily, he is a rather more prominent figure in the art world, and this was easily remedied. But had it been Samuel Abbott that was misnamed, it would have made research on him a lot more difficult. I genuinely feel bad for Samuel Abbott. He seemed to be a nice man, maybe, I don't know, but he was elderly and he was last seen opening windows trying to somehow air out the fire. I'm not quite sure, but the most tragic part was that he was so close to escaping. His body was lost in the ruins and it wasn't discovered until March 31st. And here's an excerpt from the Brooklyn Times Union article titled Body is Found in Albany Ruins. About 7.30 o'clock this morning, as the men tackled the debris near the entrance, they discovered a charred leg protruding upwards. Shortly after, the body was uncovered and taken from the ruins. The head and trunk were not burned, but the four limbs were charred. Had Abbott been able to continue on his way, he would have found safety within five feet. The door, although locked, is partly glass and would have been broken easily. It is supposed the smoke drove him out of the library proper, and he was overcome on his way to safety. This is also the main excerpt that I base the narration on since, well, naturally, since he died. Not much is available on what happened to Samuel during that night, though there are many, many accounts of other staff members. I did weave other facts from articles and newspaper clippings and things that I found into the rest of the narration. So, yes, parts of the sandstone actually did melt under the heat of the fire. That is how hot it got. The giant skylight completely shattered from the heat, and the way the building is constructed, the narrow stone hallways and things actually acted as like chimneys for the flames. So flames were literally shooting out through hallways, through the windows, and paper was shooting out of the building and could be found for pretty much miles. While the cause of the fire is still debated, nowadays it's usually attributed to a cigar or cigarette that was discarded improperly during the caucus since they did use that library, foolishly, as a smoking room. However, all the newspapers of the day did say it was due to faulty wiring, most likely, because that was mentioned and it was the cause of the previous fire in the building. There were also reports of electrical issues in the assembly room and the assembly library days prior to the fire, so it is a possibility 
I guess they're blaming it on a a switch, I think possibly for a lamp, but it was started the fire was started on a desk and it was so small that they could have put it out with a bucket of water, but they didn't have any water handy and it eventually just grew and spread into the disaster that it was. In fact, this fire that happened over a century ago still impacts us today. Since the fire destroyed so many historical records, even those dating to colonial times before we were even our own country, they were completely destroyed. But this does lead me to address a major part of the story that has become a legend, and that is that none of the indigenous artifacts were damaged in the fire. I so wanted this to be true. Because it is an obviously like ominous and spooky fact that has spread over this last century, and I like the idea of it, but it's only partially true, and it's not due to supernatural intervention. The night of the fire, many brave librarians, archivists, and archaeologists did what any of us would do, and that is attempt to save our cultural heritage. All of our training says that we should save ourselves and not worry about things, but if you're a librarian, you really have an understanding and attachment to these items that may seem irrational, but we will do whatever we can to save cultural heritage, especially when it's like documents by the founding fathers. So it turns out that Arthur Parker, who was the first New York State archaeologist, ran the length of the fourth floor hallway brandishing a tomahawk that was passed down through generations of Seneca natives. He used this tomahawk as a fire axe to break open the display cases and collect as many artifacts as he was able to. Unfortunately, he only managed to save about 50 of the 500 Iroquois artifacts that were on display, but it was better than having them all perish in the flames. And yes, there are many issues with how these objects were acquired and whatnot, but it is important that these were saved for the indigenous people of today who probably most likely definitely don't have access to these materials now, but they were saved. And unfortunately, this was due to human intervention and not the spectral. It would have been much better if these had been mysteriously saved by the forces of some of these indigenous ancestors, but sadly, it was just a white savior. Other librarians and archivists at the Capitol managed to save rare volumes and artifacts, including the original manuscript of George Washington's farewell address and the copy of the Emancipation Proclamation that Abraham Lincoln wrote by hand. So, as you can imagine, there are many, many important documents like these that were lost. And of course, this was before computers and digitization and even copying machines. So there were no other copies except perhaps in books, which also may have been published by the library and therefore only kept in the library and therefore were also destroyed. In doing my research and reading through newspaper articles, one of the more heartwarming things that I read were the letters and articles and telegrams from other librarians from across the world lending assistance and giving their condolences. In an article in the Syracuse Post Standard, Mary J. Sibley, who was the librarian at Syracuse University, offered the use of their library to the Capitol Building State Library School, which was founded by none other than Melville Dewey. I also found this interesting because there was a woman librarian, and nowadays we think of librarians as solely being women, as it's kind of turned into that. But initially, when this started, all the famous initial librarians um, were men because you had to be educated and whatever, blah, 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 to be a librarian. So I thought it was interesting that there was a head librarian at a university who was a woman. I'm not sure when the profession began to shift more towards women, but it was still interesting to me that there was a librarian of power, so to speak, in such a high position that was a woman. I don't know. Love that. Also, interestingly, the head librarian from the Imperial University in Tokyo also sent kind words and support for the capital via telegram. So this fire and the famous Triangle Shirtwaist Coat Factory fire happened within days of each other, which fortunately did lead to major fire and safety reforms. Although this didn't stop fires from happening, it did lead to a lot of safety measures that prevented loss of life. Library fires have destroyed so many important records throughout history, 
Probably most famously, the 1921 fire in the Library of Congress that destroyed almost the entirety of the 1890 census, or more recently, the 2018 museum fire in Brazil that destroyed over 200 years of records and artifacts. And one of the most annoying things I hear about this is, why didn't they have it all scanned? Why wasn't it all digital? And there's a lot to unpack here. And that would probably take another hour of me lecturing and explaining the intricacies of not only digitization, but digital preservation and physical record keeping. But I will give you the Cliff Notes version. And that is that most of the world's knowledge is on paper, well over 90% of it, in fact. And why isn't it digital? It should be digital. I agree. But there's a number of factors that lead to things being stuck on paper. And one of the biggest contributing factors is that it's expensive. It takes a lot of manual labor that libraries, museums, and archives just don't have the funding or the manpower for. In addition to physical storage and digital storage costs and the cost of maintenance, a lot of people think that digital records are, you know, 100% safe, that they're, that they're not going to be burned or whatever, but digital records are actually a lot more volatile than paper records. Like how many times have you opened a file on your computer to find out that it was corrupt or you accidentally deleted something from your hard drive? These types of things happen all the time and can wipe out thousands of records in an instant. But beyond that, people don't know that digital records need constant upkeep to keep their integrity because file formats do become obsolete. How many times have you opened something from an old computer that you can't access anymore because the program is obsolete? Or more importantly, digital records suffer from bit rot, and people don't think about it, but digital files do rot and they do decay. So the long and short of it is that paper records are actually typically easier to preserve. Ideally, you would have the paper originals, and then you would have numerous digital surrogates that would be stored in different geographic locations with different natural disaster threats where regular checksums would be performed on them to ensure that they have file integrity and all this stuff. But I digress. The moral of the story is that digital media is more prone to destruction, and it requires constant upkeep, while paper records can be managed more or less with benign neglect. So, okay, I am sorry for the lecture. I get excited about these topics, but let's get on to a topic that you're excited about, and that is ghosts. We have ghosts we haven't even met yet. So the spirit of the fruit vendor was said to be discovered when a female tour guide was locking up for the night and she saw a large black mass fall from the upper floors to the ground below. And when she went down, to her surprise, there was absolutely nothing there. She told her fellow tour guides about it and they were confused because they had never heard of any ghost sightings on that side of the building. It was discovered apparently, quote, much later that in 1890, a depressed fruit vendor flung himself from the fourth floor Senate chamber staircase and died. Now, there are numerous reports now of people seeing something fall from the staircase and when they look, either there's nothing or they see a man bleeding out onto the marble floor. However, once they go to get help or they blink and look back, there's nothing there. So I decided to investigate this myself since we don't even have a name for this fruit vendor, which had me doubting his existence, honestly. However, I did come across a story on a complete fluke, and I would honestly have never found this information if it wasn't for a happy accident and some faulty OCR. So if you don't know, OCR is Optical Character Recognition, which is essentially computer software that allows text on images to be read. So I was searching for fruit vendors in 1890 using the modern day spelling V-E-N-D-O-R, but luckily the OCR on a newspaper was wrong and it had read it as a modern day spelling, but it turns out in 1890 they spell vendor V-E-N-D-E-R. I was happy to find that, and another reason why I couldn't find much of anything even using that spelling was that for some really odd reason, the story of this fruit vendor's suicide was an exclusive story to a Brooklyn newspaper. Now, Brooklyn is nowhere near Albany, but again, I digress. The news clipping is honestly super graphic, in my opinion, for the time, but the article from the Brooklyn Citizen reads as follows. An unusual suicide. A fruit vendor kills himself in the state capital. Special to the citizen. Albany, 
April 17th. At about 8.45 this morning, Jacob Thorne, a sidewalk fruit vendor, jumped or fell down the Senate staircase, a distance of 85 feet, to the second floor and was instantly killed, his head being crushed to jelly. He was about 65 years of age and had been in ill health for some time and was supposed by many to be slightly deranged. The suicide theory is accepted as the body lay almost at the center of the court. Thanks to this article, we do know that the fruit vendor's name was Jacob Thorne. Why he's never mentioned by name anywhere is honestly beyond me. Um, I always think that the dead should be remembered, and I'm just glad that his name is at least out there somewhere. So hopefully anyone doing research on the state capitol will hopefully find this podcast and use his name. Now, there is another spirit whose name should also be remembered, and that is the construction worker whose spirit was said to may or may not haunt the grounds. In all the stories I read, it said that there was a man who was plastering the ceilings in the Senate Assembly Room in 1878 when he suddenly fell on a Saturday night, and his body wasn't discovered until Monday morning, still alive, but barely so. Doctors attempted to save his life, but he died two days later. Now, is this story the truth? It's honestly hard to tell. According to the Buffalo Courier and the Poughkeepsie Eagle, on Monday, October 29th, 1878, two men had fallen while working on the Capitol building on the same day, but at different times, and both were seriously injured. So there's already one discrepancy, that there were two men, Patrick Stanton and John Hunt. Now, Stanton fell from the scaffolding while Hunt fell through a ventilation hole in the ceiling when trying to remove its cover. Another inaccuracy here is that this incident, they both occurred on a Monday morning and not over the weekend as the ghost story supposes. Now, they were both immediately taken to the hospital for medical attention, but in my research, neither of them appears to have died, but it is rather confusing. There was a John Hunter that died the same day, uh, October 30th, who was a Mason. However, his body's buried in Brooklyn and his name was Hunter and not Hunt. Again, what's with this particular story and Hunt and Hunters being confused? I don't know. So it's possible it could have been him, but the name wasn't really a match, so I, I highly doubt it. The fact that he was a Mason may just be coincidence. However, the article title in the Poughkeepsie Eagle was interesting to me for a number of reasons, but it does say that there was a death from the injuries. So the title is as follows. Important River News. Two accidents at the Capitol died from his injuries. The body of Egan found in the river, fires. A pet dog roasted in an oven. Strange disappearance of an aged lady. Sad accident in Troy. Now, okay, I'm sure that you heard what I saw. Um, and it is a sidebar that we will be touching on. I come across so many bizarre stories when reading newspapers for research, and this dog story, I, I needed to look at it. I needed to read, I needed to learn, and I need to share it with you. I shouldn't laugh at it, but when I saw that newspaper headline and read it, I laughed out loud because like, what is it? What? Okay, so this is the story of a pet dog roasted in an oven. A lady living on Front Street, west of Swan, had a favorite little pet dog about the house up to Thursday last. On that day, he mysteriously disappeared, and Sunday, when the lady had occasion to open for the first time since Thursday, the oven door of the kitchen stove, the roast remains of her pet were found. What? I honestly need to know more. I have so many questions. I, this story is bizarre and strange, but unfortunately that is not why we're here. And I, I can't waste any more time wondering about this. So you're going to be just as confused as I am. So back to the issue at hand. Curiously, the article also mentioned that there was a fatality of someone by the name of Riley in the assembly room, possibly due to the ventilation holes at some point prior to this incident with the two men that fell. So that could be the ghost of the worker who fell. Or is this just an additional death that had not been mentioned anywhere previously that I have just rediscovered? Either way, this is a mystery that, unfortunately, I spent over an hour just trying to find out who this Riley person was in the story. But for now, that's just one that's going to remain unsolved. I just do not have the resources to do so. I'm sure the librarians that work at the Capitol would be able to figure this out in an instant. I'm sure they have this information somewhere. But I'm not sure who this Riley fellow was or how he died. It seems like he fell, but I couldn't find anything about it. 
However, if either of these men from this one Monday were to have died, it seems like it would have been John Hunt to be the one to die, as the newspaper says he was suffering from, quote, intense internal pain, um, and they couldn't find the cause of it. So I think if anyone died of the injuries, like the title suggested, but not the article, that it would have been John Hunt. But again, unknown. So the ghost of this fallen worker is either John Hunt, Patrick Stanton, or this Riley character. Now again, um, having to do with ceilings and also the Hunt Hunter thing, the ghost of William Morris Hunt is said to often be felt in the assembly chamber where his prized works were covered up and then later destroyed by the fire. Now, no one has ever actually seen William Morris Hunt's ghost. He's only been felt in the area and the lights will occasionally flicker. Which could be his ghost, but it also makes me think about the faulty wiring that may have started the fire, since the lights were flickering up until the day of the fire. Now, the doorknobs in the assembly room also rattle, and doors there slam shut and open on their own, which is attributed to William Morris Hunt's ghost. But I like to think of it as the ghost of Samuel Abbott. Just making sure doors are locked and making sure that they're shut securely as he makes his nightly rounds, just ensuring the safety of everyone. Just the idea that Mr. Abbott is still trying to keep everyone safe and that the Capitol building has this guardian spirit um, really just makes me smile. And I think we're going to close on this smile-worthy note. There's so much history that was lost and there's so much history to uncover and talk about just regarding the New York State Capitol building itself that I I could dedicate like a two-hour long episode to it. I just couldn't fit everything in. Now, I wasn't able to find many firsthand experiences like at all, just hearsay, again, because this is a state building. It's a government building. You need security clearance to get in there. Ghost things happen at night, and they only let tours happen, I think, during Halloween every year. So if anyone's to see and experience things, it's probably going to be the tour guides or employees of the state, and they don't typically post about it on Reddit or do interviews for news articles about hauntings because they want to seem sane and credible, which again, are any of our elected officials or anything really sane and what? Anyways, I digress. I'm also recording this episode on a Tuesday night because I spent way too much time investigating some of these ghosts, so I'm hoping... If you're listening to this, it's obviously out, but I'm just hoping to get it edited and out by Wednesday morning. Also, if you like this podcast, make sure you do subscribe. And if you know any friends who might be interested in this particular content, this blend of history and ghosts, although I feel like lately it's, I think it's, this is really just a history podcast with like a slight paranormal aftertaste, which is fine with me. I think the stories that we cover are really interesting, even if the ghost sightings aren't really there. Um, But please, stay away from ventilation holes, stay off of scaffolding, say thank you to your local librarian, and as always, stay curious and stay spooky. Until next time, bye. (laughs) 